Welcome everyone. My name is Amanda. I am the Assistant Director of the Center for Urban and Regional Excellence. And today's session is Understanding and Responding to Dementia-Related Behavior. Our presenter today is Julie Collins. Julie is the Northwest Indiana Program Manager for the Greater Indiana Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. She has worked with the senior community for many years and has a passion for helping those affected by Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as their caregivers. She enjoys working with her volunteers and sharing the free resources offered by the Alzheimer's Association. In her spare time, Julie loves spending time with her husband and three teenagers, gardening, hiking at the Indiana Dunes, and volunteering in her community. Joining Julie today is a special guest, Bianca Kirtan. Bianca is a community outreach specialist with the Indiana University School of Nursing, and she will be discussing the CARE Collaborative Aging Research and Engagement Study. Welcome, Julie and Bianca. We are glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much. It's good to have everyone here today. And today, um, we are going to be talking about understanding and responding to dementia-related behavior. So in the middle stage of dementia, you will see um, lots of changes and behaviors that may be difficult to deal with. By the end of today's program, you'll be able to identify common triggers for behaviors, explain the process for assessing and identifying challenging behaviors, and list strategies to address common dementia-related behaviors. So again, here we go. Um, so in the middle stages, like I was saying, you might see behavior changes with your loved one or friend with dementia. So again, pain and discomfort, that is a big one. So fatigue, hunger, thirst, constipation, full bladder, um, or even just being uncomfortable with a room temperature. Sometimes if you can't express, like if the room is too hot and you can't express that that's bothering you, then you might have a behavior. Um, and although some causes may be hard to sort out, it is helpful to take steps outlined in these next slides to understand and respond to the needs expressed through the behaviors you might be seeing. So um, we're going to look at detecting and connecting, addressing physical needs first, then you want to address emotional needs, and then you want to reassess and plan for the next time. So when you're detecting and connecting, you definitely want to join the person in his or her own reality by trying to see the world through his or her eyes. That's one of the most important things that you can do when you're dealing with someone with dementia. You have to remember that although it might not seem logical to us what their behavior is, but to them, that is their reality. And that's something that we can't change. So we just have to enter into their reality. And since they're the one with the disease, we can't expect them to accommodate our needs. So instead, again, we have to enter their world, connect with them as they are, and do our best to decode what they're, what they're expressing. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free during the presentation. So, and sometimes we can't figure out where the behavior is coming from. However, it is our job to make every attempt to understand um, before intervening so we know how to help. And so to understand the behavior, we have to start with some detective work and we have to try to determine the trigger for the behavior. So it's good to ask yourself when the behavior took place, who was present when it took place? Maybe there's a certain person that causes um, certain feelings for the person with dementia. And what, helped, what happened before the behavior began? And where did the behavior take place? And so that would trigger you to think, what was the person seeing, hearing, or touching? And when does it tend to occur? So if it takes place in the morning, maybe there's something in the morning that's bothering them, or maybe they're having sundowning. And you definitely want to connect with the person as you assess the situation. So you always want to approach the person with respect. Although some of the behavior may be childlike, you never want to treat them like a child. They are still an adult. And you always want to come to the person from the front. So if someone is in a wheelchair, for example, and you you know, come from behind and grab the wheelchair and start to push it, that can be very unnerving for the person with dementia. So it's always good to come around the front and tell them who you are, identify yourself if necessary. And then you want to move to their physical level. Making eye contact is huge. That's such a big help to make eye contact and convey friendly language. And the person will respond much more to your tone and body language than your words. So it's important to be kind and helpful. So if you're feeling stressed out, sometimes they will feel stressed out just because they can feel your feelings. So it's important to be very calm 
even if you're having a bad day, um, just to try to find a way to relax. And addressing physical needs is so important. So with physical needs, um, it could be anything. It could be any medical condition. It could be arthritis bothering them. Urinary tract infections are very common with people with dementia, and it's very hard for them to tell you that that's what's happening. So um, another thing could be poorly fitting dentures, something we would never think about, but if you have a poorly fitting denture, people who have dentures know that can be very painful, but they might not be able to tell us about that. Could be indigestion, um, constipation. In addition, behaviors may change due to a reaction to a new medical um, interaction between several medications. So if they're having trouble, it could be any of those things, but it could also be as simple as um, maybe a medication change, which you would need to contact their doctor for. And it's often difficult for them to recognize why they're feeling that way. That's why it's important to really kind of go through that list, kind of like a checklist of why they're feeling that way and see if you can help. And definitely, again, you wanna call the doctor as soon as possible if you see these things happening. Um, additional causes for discomfort. Things that seem simple, but they really can cause grief for the person it could include hunger, thirst, just the need to stretch and move. Sometimes if you're sitting constantly, just getting a little exercise and moving just a little bit might help you feel better. Uh, sometimes they need to use the bathroom, or it could be as simple as the room is too dark or too bright and too noisy or quiet. Sometimes um, a lot of stimulation can be too much. Uh, it being in an uncomfortable position. So if someone doesn't have the ability to move their body, you may have to consider helping them with that. So talking about understanding and addressing behavior, we wanna also talk about the emotional needs of the person. So you wanna always avoid correcting, even though it seems logical for us with um, normal brains to just say, you know what, that's not how, that's not right. That's not really how it is. But unfortunately, that could cause an argument and make them feel bad. So you just have to make sure that you're, again, goes back to meeting them where they are on their journey. Definitely avoid correcting them. Um, if, like I said, even if you know it's inaccurate. And again, I know I keep saying it, but meeting them where they are is just crucial. And let them know that you're with them. Even if you're not talking, just sitting with them. And saying, you know, I'm here, you could be shoulder to shoulder, just sitting shoulder to shoulder so they know you're there and reinforce that you're there to help. Here's a video um, and I'll let you listen to this. And if you have any questions, let me know. She was part of the family, you know, she'd fold towels and she'd fold towels all day long some days. You just, you know, put them back in the basket and then she'd give them to her, here's some more towels. and. It sound it may look sound like it's cruel, but look, it kept her busy. It kept her movements going. It kept her, you know, just kept her occupied, and it kept and it made her feel um, wanted and that she was contributing. We created a routine for her that worked for her around her agitation and you know her sleep patterns. So every day she was in the same routine for the most part. And every day she did something. She was always in the kitchen every day helping do something. Sometimes she'd rinse dishes, but she was always near the kitchen sink because she spent most of her life in front of the kitchen sink. Now she was just doing it in different ways. And um, yeah, going for a walk, going out in the car for a drive, uh, walking around the yard, you know, um, watering plants. Those are all things that she did and we just had her continue doing them. So understanding and addressing the behavior, you want to always look at what happened. Sometimes you just want to think, gosh, this is over. I'm done with it. But you definitely want to reassess the plan for next time because it could happen again. And again, when you find out what those triggers are, you may be able to change that. So go back to detecting and connecting join the person's reality, and what went well when the person was having a problem and what didn't, and how can you make adjustments? So, and you can apply, apply these to any behavior again. So, um, when we talk about anxiety or agitation, so if you're seeing restlessness or pacing, distress, or even over-reliance on the caregiver, 
So when someone with dementia is restless or pacing, distressed or excessively reliant on caregivers, he or she might be experiencing anxiety. So let's take a look at Anne's situation, and then we'll explore how taking these four steps that we outlined um, might help. So Anne, a 75 year old woman with Alzheimer's disease was pacing the hallways in her house in the evening saying, I need to go, I need to go. She would not stop walking even for meals. Her family would give her sandwiches to eat while she was walking. Though she used a cane, she was getting blisters on her feet and had lost weight from, from not eating. Her family would ask Anne to sit down but as soon as she sat, she would immediately get up and start pacing again. Anne had worked for 40 years as a nurse on the night shift and her agitation began every evening. Her shoes were worn and she appeared to be in pain as she walked. So we wanna keep Anne's situation in mind as we review these steps. So step one, detect and connect. Again, try to think about why it happened what was going on when it happened, and address physical issues first. Um, you have to assess for pain, infection, medication, interaction, or other medical issue, um, and intervene as needed. So many times, abrupt surges in, in agitation can result from the pain from medical conditions. Again, we go back to the urinary tract infections. Here we're talking about, and her feet are hurting, and there could be some other reason. So um, we want to you know, kind of break that down and see what the problem could be. And again, we have to look at Anne. Was she hungry, thirsty, lacking social interaction? Because this can trigger concern in the person that can escalate to anxiety or agitation. So to avoid this, you have to provide the person with access to appropriate healthy snacks and beverages and offer them periodically. Because again, they might not be able to tell you when you're hungry or thirsty. So you kind of have to stay on top of that. And again, constipation can be a trigger for agitation. So you have to make sure their diet includes plenty of fruit, fiber, um, lots of water, lots of fluids, and you have to be careful to include sufficient exercise. So even if that means just taking a walk, walking outside and taking a short walk, or even doing chair exercises, that's helpful. So you can also consult with a dietitian or a physical therapist about these things. And then you wanna address the emotional needs. Why was Anne acting like that? Again, acknowledge that you understand that the person is frustrated because if you say that's ridiculous, you don't need to be frustrated about that. That is going to make it worse and tell them you want to help them feel more comfortable. And then you want to check to see if something happened. Maybe they got, you know, maybe their feelings were hurt. They're feeling frustration, loneliness or other distress and um, join them, the person in the physical activity. So again, if you need to take a walk, go with them, stay with them and just let them know you're here or whatever physical activity it might be, just be present with them. And once a level of agitation um, reduces a bit, you can offer to engage in another activity. So um, you definitely wanna change the uh, level of anxiety. So for confusion and suspicion, not recognizing familiar people, places, or things, um, accusing people of theft, infidelity, those are not very, you know, that is not always unusual. So when someone with Alzheimer's disease is confused, he or she may not recognize familiar people, which can be very painful to the people that love them, um, places or things they might not know where their home is. So when the confusion is accompanied by suspicion, the person may accuse others of stealing, being unfaithful, which again, seem, they may seem ridiculous, um, but it's how they're feeling. So it can be very difficult for caregivers when the person cannot remember um, that they are the caregiver. Somebody maybe you've cared about for 50 years all of a sudden doesn't understand why you're there with them. So let's look at Anne again as she begins to experience some confusion and suspicion, and then we'll explore the four steps um, how they're, and talk about how we can um, help with the situation. So when Anne's family comes to visit and evening begins, she becomes very suspicious that people are trying to get into her house and are watching her through the big picture windows. She becomes suspicious of her family for not making the people go away and that they must all be in cahoots together. So 
So again, we're going to keep Anne's situation in mind. And number one, you want to try when you're getting accused of these things, you want to try as calm, stay as calm as you possibly can. So what is she confused about? Why is she so suspicious? Like what's happening and with who and why is it manifesting right now? So check the environment. There may be something in, in the environment that's causing confusion. So um and think about something that may have happened in the past. And if the trigger is current, explore how the person is interpreting the occurrence. Like what is she seeing that's making her believe that? For example, if the person has misplaced something, he or she may worry that it has been stolen. If the trigger is something imagined or in the past, try to figure out what may have triggered that. Um, number two, again, go through those physical issues that we talked about, again, urinary tract infections, arthritis, and so we want to um, you know, assess the physical discomfort, and it could be as simple as overstimulation. I've seen that many times where a person with dementia is so overstimulated, they just can't focus on anything else. And modify the environment. If you need to take down mirrors, if they seem problematic, upgrade the lighting. Um, so what's interesting in this vignette, in this situation with Anne, what was happening is she was seeing her family's reflection in the window and she was interpreting it, interpreting it as strangers looking in at them. So this was, you know, this was an easy fix. They closed the drapes and then that was a really easy fix. So, and remember that this was about diffusing the situation, not convincing the person of the truth because it won't work. When you're at that stage, it will not work to convince them of the truth. And as always, um, Remind, just remember that you have to join them in their reality. Um, and we go back to reassessing the plan for next time. Ask yourself what helped in that situation. And obviously in this situation, it was closing the curtains, but, and that may have been easier than other situations to figure out what the problem was, but each time it helps to do that. So next let's talk about aggression. Um, with aggression, you want to, it's basically a behavior that may be verbal or physical. And it may occur suddenly for no apparent reason or may emerge following a trigger. And if anyone um, that's here today is a caregiver, you know that that can be extremely stressful for you as well as the person living with dementia. So um, sometimes a person with Alzheimer's can experience aggressive behavior, which may be verbal, physical, or it could be both at the same time. And again, we have to try to figure out what the behavior is from. So let's talk about Anne again. So Anne's husband, Bill, is standing at the back of the room, leaning against the wall with his arms crossed, watching television. Anne walks in and tells him sharply, you are not the boss here. Bill ignores the comment and continues to watch television. Anne comes closer, raises her voice, and says, you can't tell me what to do. When Bill doesn't respond, Anne comes up to Bill and hits him on the arm with her bald fist. Prior to her dementia symptoms, Anne was quite calm by nature and would never have exhibited this behavior. Lately, her outbursts are becoming more frequent. She continues to, um, to come to this behavior. So Bill went to the bathroom to avoid further conflict. He does not have a cell phone with him. Since both had been avid hunters when they were younger, there are guns in the house but Bill has removed all of the ammunition. So this is a tough one. You know, when you have guns in the house, it's something to think about also, if you're living with someone with dementia, it's best to take those out of the home. So number one, we're going back to detect and connect. That would be the first thing to do in this situation. Try to identify the immediate trigger for the aggression. Did something frighten or alarm her? Um, and it may not be a logical response, but rather than an automatic reaction to something the person is perceiving. Again, maybe a hallucination or something she's seeing that she misunderstood. So gently say the person's name and let him or her know that you understand that you are there before attempting to intervene. Apologize when it seems that it would help to calm the person. You may be apologizing for something you didn't do that actually will happen quite often but the apology is a reflection of the person's reality, not yours. So again, it's just, it's going to help them. It might not make you feel better, but it will help them. 
And again, you're going to rule out those medical issues. Maybe something has triggered her. Sometimes it can happen in a very short time with the urinary tract infections or the medicine. So you just want to make sure that you are ruling all of those things out. And you want to be, when we go to um, address the emotional needs, you have to remember, again, it's very difficult, but you need to be positive and reassuring. And you need to let the person know that you're there for them and that you will stay and you'll help work the situation out. So number four, we're gonna look at the reassess, the fourth thing, reassess and plan for next time. So again, make a plan, especially when it's something so serious, when um, you know she's getting violent with the fist and everything, when you have guns in the home, um, when you're making the plan, it's gonna help you, you know, not have that surprise, especially with particularly aggressive behavior. And um, you definitely wanna take some steps to ensure the safety of everyone in the home. And alerting neighbors about the person's condition and anticipated behaviors is also a good thing to do for safety. Um, with, um, and you might even wanna alert the law enforcement so they know if they ever are called to the house, they know that there's a person living with dementia in the house. So they know how to react as well. Because if they come up and see someone behaving like that and screaming and not understanding the situation, that isn't great. So this will make it a lot easier for them. We did have a question that popped up in the uh, chat here. Um, she asks, what is sundowning? Sundowning, that's a very good question. And there's lots of studies being done on it. And dear, like three, four o'clock in the afternoon, sometime around that time, you might see behavior. People with dementia might have a very difficult time. Their behavior might change and not for the better. Um, we're not sure we're still, you know, there's always studies going on to figuring, figuring out why this is happening. Is it because the light is changing that time of day? Is it because they're tired? Are they hungry? So there's lots of things that might happen, but a lot of people who are caregivers know that about three or 4 PM, they need to, you know, watch out because their behavior might change. So that's another, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's a situation where you might want to, um, if you know, that's coming plan ahead, you know, and see what you can do to avoid it. You might be not be able to completely avoid it, but maybe you you know make the house very calm at that time. Or if it's if it's the light change, maybe keep a lamp on at that time. Turn a light on so as the sun goes down or the light is changing and triggering triggering something in their brain, the light in the house might make you know make up for that. So um, it could be maybe turn on music, not current music, but music that they loved when they were younger. Um, sometimes that's a nice way to calm them down. So thinking of things that might calm them down at that time is really good, or you being extra calm at that time and taking out any distractions that might cause trouble. Sometimes even like having that news on in the background that's loud, you know, bothering them. If you're going to have the TV on, maybe turn on Animal Planet or something that's more calm and, or like, again, soft music. So did that answer your question? She said, yes, that, okay, that answered her question. But yes, we do have more questions. How do we help with situations where our loved one is in assistant living um, for memory support? She said um, she is not there when like events happen and they are reported to her by the facility um, and she feel like they want um, her to help. Something you could talk to them about, number one, what is the time it's happening? That would make it a lot easier, right? If the same thing is happening over and over at the same time, that's number one. You figured that out. Maybe it's dinner time. Maybe it's the noise of the plates. Well, and I also wanted to let you know, our helpline is available. Um, I'll just say the number now, but it is at the end of our program. So if someone has to leave for some reason, so we have excellent people on our helpline who are ready to help. Never closes. It's open 24-7. And that number is 800-272-3900. This program that you're watching now um, is obviously live or on YouTube, but there's also programs at training.alz.org. You can go to our website, alz.org, and access any of our programs. So we have one called Effective Communication Strategies. That's also really good. Similar to this, and it teaches strategies for helping people who may be in a similar situation to you. So, But the things we've talked about so far, those would be the first things that I would try. Um, if not, call our helpline. You can find me too. But okay. yeah, we, we definitely would love to help you with that. But I think finding the time is going to be a big one. And again, 
make sure she is not having any health issues. Maybe her clothing is too tight. The dentures, they seem like simple things, but boy, oh boy, they can really cause the person to feel bad. So, and here we go with aggression. So usually aggressive behaviors associated with dementia are upsetting, normally not dangerous. And occasionally the person is um, a danger to themselves or others, um, then safety measures need to be taken if that happens. And speak with the person's doctor about medical interventions, which again could be medication, um, different things. And when you're really in a, in a bind, call 911. But again, that goes back to letting the um, emergency responders, police officers, paramedics, fire department, it doesn't hurt to just call them and say, my mom lives here with me. And I know your mom, you know, Cynthia lives in an assisted living, but if your mom lives with you, it would be a good time to let them know that this person lives here. Sometimes they may have behaviors and this is why I'm letting you know. So if, if something happens, you can come. So repetition, when you think of dementia, often people that don't know much about it, they'll say, oh, it's just where you repeat the same thing over and over, but there's so many more things associated with that. And all of the things we talked about with repetition, will, the four different things will work with this as well. Here's Sam Fazio, and um, I will um, play a video from him. Repetition is really one of the most common and also um, frustrating uh, behaviors for caregivers. It's important to really just um, take a minute, take a breath, and really think about how you could help that person with the answer that they're looking for. Um, it really makes no sense to sort of bump heads with them and try to correct them or try to tell them to stop asking it because they really can't remember that they just asked you that a minute ago. So thinking about how you could provide an answer that's reassuring, even though you might be doing it over and over and over again. So again, I'm guessing if you have a person with dementia that you've dealt with this and being patient is, um, and if you're stressed, trying to not be stressed around them. And just if you have to answer it 10 times, that's okay too. So let's keep Anne's situation in mind again. And here's another little vignette we can talk about. Anne has recently been concerned about an upcoming visit from her daughter. Though her daughter Katie is not scheduled to visit for another two weeks, Anne has begun to repeatedly ask her husband, Bill, when she will arrive. Anne asks several times throughout the day, every day, which has begun to wear on Bill. He finds himself answering impatiently or even ignoring Anne's questions. At, at the same time, Anne is going into the bathroom much more frequently than she ever has before, every 10 to 20 minutes. Again, we want to detect what is happening. So we want to address the physical issues first. So again, we're seeing that change in Anne going into the bathroom. And we want to um, explore what's happening with her. Uh, there sometimes are, like, the, uh, you want to address physical needs. So sometimes maybe there's an on-call doctor, urgent care. But definitely try to find out if there might be something physical that's triggering that behavior. And again, she's going into the bathroom more often than normal. Um, addressing the emotional needs, focus on the emotion that the person is exhibiting. If it's anxiety, frustration, fear. Say something that recognizes that emotional state to help you move to the next step in your intervention. And again, always keep the emotion behind the behavior in mind because there usually is some reason, like we've talked about, like Cynthia brought up, there's usually some reason that they're behaving that way. Usually you won't just see it all of a sudden. There's usually something that's triggered them. And if you have to repeat the same answer, then that's okay too. Uh, reassess the plan for next time. Finally, ask yourself whether your new response has helped. Maybe you behaved differently and you have to see if that made a difference, just like the people at assisted living, what you were talking about. Maybe, um, you know, they're trying to help you find an answer and going through some of these things might help. So wandering, this is a tricky one. So 60% of people with dementia will wander and it can happen at any stage without warning. I've had people say to me, you know, Julie, my dad's only driving into town to the barber, it's three streets, and he's totally fine driving, but you have to ask yourself, when is gonna be the first time he might get lost? So he might be fine today, but maybe tomorrow he won't. So that's why it's so darn important to make sure that you're keeping a tab on that with your medical professional. 
So applying the steps, let's take a, take a look at Ann and Bill as they deal with incidents of Ann's wandering. Ann and Bill spent the early years of their marriage in New Jersey. They moved out of the state to their current home 30 years ago. Ann constantly asked to visit New Jersey. She frequently leaves the home in the morning while Bill is showering and states, I'm going to go to New Jersey. She has been found by neighbors on many occasions at their church on neighborhood streets and one time a very busy intersection near their home. Their daughter, Katie, is quite worried about this potential injury. Bill is also worried, but he's at a loss about what to do. He's very logical and tries to explain to Anne the reasons they cannot visit New Jersey, though he recognizes that this approach is not working because, again, he's reasoning with her and that's not going to work. So the, the approach he was using was making more Anne, Anne more angry and more um, wandering incidents were occurring. So again, here we go, detect and connect. Um, ask who, what, where, why, when, what was the possible trigger that's making her wander and join with the person um, and maybe even kind of agree with them, whatever they're saying and just um, address physical issues first. Again, go through the list of things that might be going on and what's happening with her. And often when a person is doing that, when they're wandering, they might be responding, responding to an unmet need such as hunger, thirst, having to go to the bathroom, desire to get away from something. So maybe something's really bothering them in that environment at that time. Again, it could be noise, too much noise um, or something unpleasant and desire to go home or go outside and engage with others. So um, address the emotional needs. Are they bored? Are they not feeling stimulated? Making sure that your person is getting enough stimulation is super important. It could be anything, and sometimes it's hard, sometimes they don't want to, but it could be anything from taking a walk again or sitting outside, listening to the birds, doing a puzzle. Um, and I always tell people, you always want your person with dementia to be able to be successful at whatever they do. So if your person used to do a 500 piece puzzle, but that's too overwhelming and they can't be successful, get them a dollar, you know, like, a 10 piece puzzle, something that they can succeed at, even if it's not what they're used to, not what you're used to, if they can succeed at it and it's stimulating their mind, that's a positive. Or maybe a coloring book, but keeping them stimulated is so important, but not overstimulated. That's where the trick comes in. Um, and you want to pro provide reassurance to your person that you're together, that you are there for her, even if she's upset, just so you know, she knows that you're there and help the person to do what they want. Um, even if it's going outside, roaming, maybe grab your coat and go with them. Um, even if it's almost lunchtime and you, you said, you know what, lunch is cooking, we gotta stay home. Maybe turn off the stove and just go for that short walk. Maybe it'll make her feel better and it's diffusing the situation. And make changes to their surroundings um, to help reduce the risk of wandering. So um, putting dark mats in the, in front of the doors to make them look like holes, which the person might avoid. Camouflaging doors and door jams. And I'm guessing many of you have seen that in maybe like memory, um, memory units or other places, people will disguise their door, make it look like a shelf, then the person doesn't realize it's a door. Or you can just um, kind of cover the doorknob, make that look like it's not a doorknob. And definitely provide structured routine for the day. Um, doing so is going to keep them busy and it alle alleviate boredom and it might help um, also get rid of that wandering behavior and a community day program if you if you know of any adult day centers if your person is qualified to go to one of those they're very good they keep the person stimulated safe and as the caregiver it also gives you a break so you might want to consider looking in your community to see if there's an adult day center we do have some questions that came up Please, in the chat. Absolutely. Let's do that. Are urinary tract infections common in this population? Very common. Yes. We talk about those a lot because they are common and sometimes they're hard to detect. So in, you know, with Anne in the vignette, she was going to the bathroom more often. So you might see that or pain. So sometimes, again, they're hard to detect. So that's why I always tell people, even if you can't detect them, we're not medical professionals, you know, like the caregivers. So in most cases, so what you can do is call your doctor. If you see that usually there'll be some sort of 
pretty quick behavior change. It's a progressive disease, so you might always see changes, but when you see them over a day or two or three or a week and it's drastic, call the doctor. It could be a urinary tract infection. We also have, is it common for them to take off their clothes unscheduled? Is there a way to control this? Um, that would be one of those, yes, it is. Um, I've heard that numerous times. And um, something you could do about that is redirect them. Again, you go into you know redirecting instead of trying to stop them, arguing with them, because whatever is triggering them, try to figure out what in the environment, whenever they're doing that, and if you want to share any more, feel free, but no pressure. Whatever, whenever they're doing that, what is going on around them that they feel they need to take off their clothes? You might be able to figure it out. You might not. But if you can't, at least try to redirect them. You know, just say, you know what, you can take off your clothes, but let's do this first. And if they argue, you know, that might be a problem, but those are just a few strategies that you might employ. And she also added uh, that she only has Medicare and um, can we get respite care so caregivers can get a break? I would call our helpline, the number I gave you, 800-272-3900. And I know people on this call might be in different areas of the state and the country. So um, by calling our helpline, they can really talk to you about that because our helpline is national and they can um, help you focus on how you would go about that, um, getting respite care. And you could also call um, your AAA agency, which um, again, the helpline can help you find. So that's always a good starting point to find help. Uh, what is there for her emotional needs? Good question. Um, this was really focused a lot on the person with dementia and helping our caregivers, um, you know, understand to how to help them. But our support groups, we have support groups nationally. So by calling our helpline, they can tell you where our support groups are. And sometimes it's really hard to get away for that hour, right? Even when you're a caregiver, I don't know your personal situation. But um, when you're the caregiver, it's exhausting. And often we see caregivers end up in the emergency room because they've you know, done too much. So getting a break is crucial. It's, it's easy for me to say sitting here when I don't have someone currently in my home with dementia. But getting that break is so important if you have a friend from church or however you can get away you know, weekly. Make, make time for yourself. Um, but our support groups are super helpful. Sometimes they're hard the first time to go to because you don't know what to expect. But once you're there, uh, one description from one of my volunteer um, support group facilitators, she says, Julie, our, we keep the um, support group to one hour. Everybody gets to share what's going on and other people can tell you what they've currently done to um, help themselves. But then she said, it's an hour, but then these people end up you know, having relationships, friend, you know, friends that they can help each other. So they go in the parking lot and talk. So sometimes it's just being out of your home, but also talking to other people who are in the situation because Dementia, the way I describe it to people when they first start their journey, it's really an isolating disease. And anyone on here, I'm sure you can agree. It's so isolating, so difficult. But when you know you're not alone, that could be calling our helpline, going to one of our support groups. Those are great ways to, um, to feel supported. We also have a what medication addresses Alzheimer's or dementia directly? That is a good one, again, for to talk to your medical professional about. There is no, um, there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. That's why um, the Alzheimer's Association, other than the US and Chinese government, we fund more research than any other organization. So we're very serious about hoping we find a cure at some point. But um, so the medications that are available, you know, they would help with behaviors. So again, you could call the helpline if you'd like to know about specific um, drugs. They might be able to tell you a little bit more, but your medical professional is for sure um, frontline who you'd want to talk to. So if you can't get a hold of the doctor, call the nurse. Um, and on our website, there's also quite a bit of information about things like that. And again, the helpline is available um, if you're in Northwest Indiana. I'm available, so I know Bianca is here. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation, Julie. Um, while I get my screen up, I didn't know if you had already mentioned specifically when the support group at um, St. Timothy's was going to begin. Thank you for bringing that up. Although we do have people from different parts of, of the state and country, we do have, if you are in Indiana, in Lake County, 
We have a support group already that takes place in Dyer, but we have a brand new support group that will start on October 13th at 6 p.m. at St. Timothy's Community Church in Gary. And again, you can call me about that or you can call the helpline and we do ask that you register so we know how many people to plan for. And again, that's brand new. The first one will take place October 13th. And Bianca, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, I just think that's a great resource. And for sure, if people need that extra support, I think it'd be a great thing for people to get involved in, so. Yeah, and Bianca, I did wanna mention one thing I forgot, I do apologize. We have something called the Community Resource Finder. And that's fueled by AARP and the Alzheimer's Association. And if people would like to visit that online, they can go to www.alz.org slash CRF. And there you can put your zip code in and you can put what service you're looking for. If it's support groups, programs, home health care, elder law attorneys, you can click those things with your zip code and they will all populate whoever's registered their business. So Sorry about that, Bianca. I'll let you take over from here. No, you're okay. You're okay. I appreciate it. And feel free to put sure. that link in the chat. Um, but hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. And I'll be sure to make the most out of our next few minutes. Um, but I am Bianca Kirtan, the Community Outreach Specialist for the IU School of Nursing in Indianapolis. And today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our project that we're working on with the Alzheimer's Association called CARE and how we go about this. Um, so first, I just wanted to uh, get some definitions down. Um, so for community engagement, um, basically community engagement is when uh, groups of people are working together who share common goals um, to address issues that affect those people themselves. And one way that we try to tackle this problem is um, by using community engaged research, which is when research uh, involves uh, the input from people who are affected by the research outcomes themselves. Um, so a very collaborative way to go about research, which is how we go about our project that I'll get more into detail with later. Um, here are just some notable values of community engagement and why I think that it stands out from other research. Um, when you use community engagement, you're really valuing the equal opportunities from both researchers and participants and community partners. Um, diverse perspectives are included in community engagement, which makes the um, results more valid. Um, the goals are clear and so are the roles. Um, I think it's really important to note that the communications are continuous and also there should be a sustained effort um, with relationships after the project ends. Um, and I just think this is a very unique way to go about research versus your traditional way. Um, so our project is called CARE, or the Collaborative for Aging Research and Engagement. And here you'll see our mission statement, which is using technology to educate and engage African-American communities about brain health and Alzheimer's disease and related dementia clinical research. Um, so CARE, like I said, um, is taking place in two regions, in central Indiana, and also Northwest Indiana. And we chose these two populations because our priority population is African-Americans 45 years and older. And these two regions have the highest population of African-Americans. This is a three-year project, which is funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Institutes of Aging. And basically our overall goal is to design a brain health education platform uh, where people can learn about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, learn about what community support is out there and resources, and also to learn about other research opportunities that people can take part of. Um, and so the way that we're gonna be making this health education platform is through um, the use of community engaged research, where we ask the community themselves what they wanna see on the platform and what would make them use it versus the researchers telling the participants um, to use a certain platform. Um, and so like I've mentioned, we're um, uh, involving the Alzheimer's Association Greater Indiana Chapter, the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, the IU School of Nursing, which is who I'm representing today. And then we also have two friends from Bloomington, Indiana, the IU School of Public Health and the IU Luddy School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering, who will be working on the actual platform itself. Um, and so our overall goal is to design and develop uh, this care platform that is based in part of our community-based collaborative model. And then our long-term goals, uh, we wanna understand what makes people want to get involved in research, um, how we can successfully recruit and retain participants, 
um, and also try to get this work to scale at a regional and a national level. Um, so why is this project important? Um, well, I do want to mention that we're focusing on minority populations because there is such a lack of participation with minorities in research, and in this case, Alzheimer's disease and dementia research. And it's difficult to understand how a disease can affect individuals when you don't have the research um, to back it up with. Um, so here's just some stats. Um, so the number of Americans ages 65 and older is projected to more than double by 2060. Minorities will make up 40% of the older adult population by 2050. Um, next one here, minorities in socioeconomically disadvantaged populations are more limited in their health literacy and resources, which can then lead to a greater risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And then this one down here, older African Americans are actually twice as likely to have ADRD than older whites, um, which this can be due to um, historical disadvantages and trauma from the past. Um, so with these stats in mind, it really motivates us to encourage that minority participation in different research projects to try to gain more knowledge on how it affects our populations. Um, this is just a table that shows our research opportunities. We're starting with focus groups and our design sessions. And here are a number of participants on the right. Um, so throughout the three years, we have six research activities. And we are actually starting with our first research activity in Northwest Indiana on November 5th. And I'll have my contact information at the end if anyone's interested. Um, just showing some faces of our care team. Uh, we have a lot of people with different uh, backgrounds of expertise, um, appreciative for all of them. Here are all of our principal and uh, co-investigators. More of our research team, and you have the lovely Julie Collins down here in the right-hand corner. Um, but I really wanted to just talk about our care advisory team, um, and this is part of what makes our project community engaged. Once a month, we meet with our care advisory team to tell them about our um, decision making with the research, um, what our ideas are, what their ideas are, so that we can make sure that we have a co-learning environment. Um, so we have some uh, great representatives from both Northwest Indiana and Central Indiana that um, help us uh, make sure that this platform that we're designing and any decisions that we're making um, are culturally competent and appropriate for our populations. So I'm very, very thankful for this group of individuals. Um, they really make sure that we're emphasizing the community engagement. Um, and so the next steps, like I mentioned, we have our first uh, research activity in October, November. Our Central Indiana research will be on October 22nd and for no November, November 5th. And what will be going on during these sessions is basically we're going to have some small group discussions and ask people what they want to see on the platform. And then we'll continue and actually have some of our team making our prototypes of the platform and get some more feedback from that. Um, so we're basically taking the direct feedback that we're getting and um, altering the platform uh, accordingly. Um, and then here is my contact information. If anyone has any questions at all, just want to learn more about the project, or if you even want to get involved, let me know. Um, and then also just if anything's going on in Northwest Indiana, like I had mentioned, I'm based in Central Indiana, and I really want to make sure that I myself am engaging in the community um, as well. Uh, I'm really excited to be working in this region, and um, thank you all for coming today and learning a little bit about Alzheimer's and dementia and care. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And if anyone has any questions about um, the project, be sure to drop them in the chat. Well, while we give our participants a chance to think if they have any other questions, I just want to thank Julie and Bianca both for presenting such valuable information to us today. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time, ladies. Thank you so much. And um, truly, the Alzheimer's Association um, never wants you to walk this journey alone. So if you're a caregiver, please reach out to us. We're happy to help in any way we can answer any questions you have, let you know about the available resources. So um, thank you so much. And I think there might be a question for um, Bianca. Yes, um, they would like to know uh, information about what time the focus group is for Northwest Indiana. And then we have a similar question about if maybe you could elaborate a little bit more about what a community ambassador is and does. For sure. Um, so for Northwest Indiana on November 5th, we'll be starting about 10 a.m. 
Uh, we're actually holding it in Maryville at the Hilton Garden Inn Hotel. I do just want to type my address in there one more time in case people want to uh, reach out to me to make sure that they have the specific information. Um, and then for the community ambassadors, sorry, I did not elaborate on that. Um, so community ambassadors, we call our volunteer plus position. Um, basically, there are people of the community that will uh, share information about care, um, maybe accompany me with any presentations that I might be doing. Um, and I can also send out more information about that. Um, but with your work about once a month, uh, community ambassadors will be compensated um, $100. So that's what makes it the volunteer plus position. Um, it doesn't take too much out of your time, but it's a lot of communicating information about the project through word of mouth, uh, distributing materials, and also attendance at uh, certain community events too. So thank you. Thank you, Bianca, for that explanation. Once again, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Bianca. And thank you to all of our participants. We hope you join us again next time. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you.